Okay, we are in module number six, working our way through the course. Um, no news today. Yeah, well, I, like I said, I've been so busy on my little side project that I haven't really checked news. Um, first item on our list, obtaining evidence from a service provider. Well, a preservation order is a request to a service provider to retain records relating to a suspect. A provider can be a one of wire or electronic communication services or a remote computing service upon the request of a governmental entity shall take all necessary steps to preserve records and other evidence in its possession pending the issuance of a court order or other process. The period of retention specified in law 18 USC 2703 says that data should be retained or records should be retained for 90 days, which shall be extended for additional 90 day period upon a renewed request by a governmental entity. Service providers could contact the suspect to let them know that they're being investigated. Uh, it is more likely than not that investigators will ask a judge to request that the service provider not let them know about the investigation in, this, in a subpoena. So as investigators, law enforcement investigators, they can send out a subpoena asking a service provider like an ISP, like a cloud provider, uh, you know, or your, your phone, your phone provider for records of you up to 90 days and could also ask the company to not let you know that that's happening. According to the US Department of Justice, an investigator should secure the crime scene, ensure the safety of those around and protect potential evidence from tiny micro SD cards hidden to volatile memory in PCs to uh, fighting against remote white functions on cell phones, maybe hidden devices inside of walls, ceilings or attics to, um, you know, to find anything that has a battery life an examiner should always photograph and document everything found at the crime scene, such as the connection between devices like USB or Ethernet, document both digital related and conventional devices, such as the cables, the adapters and boxes from articles and manuals. Any post-it notes could potentially have passwords. USB drives could be hiding in things like jewelry or masked inside of a toy. Everything that you find must be, uh, must be listed in some form of evidence list, something like this, because all this stuff will be relevant when you go, when, if you have to go into a court. Seizing evidence. Finding incriminating evidence on a device is worthless if standard procedures are not followed. These protocols must be followed from the crime scene to the forensics lab to the courtroom. Defense counsels often spend much of their time questioning the actions taken by investigators instead of focusing on the actual evidence. Because if they can get the jury or the judge to agree that there is some uh, some question of it, they'll throw it out and that will help their defense. I have listed in the lecture notes a number of places where you can get some best practice guides. Crime scene investigation, like I uh, mentioned before, investigators should take copious notes about any equipment found, photographing everything, including screenshots. All media devices should be tagged and recorded. Field kits will provide the equipment necessary to acquire evidence. Everything, if I haven't said it enough, I'll say it again. Everything must be properly documented and secured. The, uh, uh, you have to do chain of custody. The assumption must 
always be that evidence acquired will end up in court. Therefore, everything must be handled in accordance with the law, legally obtained through a court order, subpoena, search warrant, or with consent of the owner. As said before, the defense attorney will focus, uh, will examine their focus into the chain of custody form and try to find any mistakes to render evidence inadmissible. For example, when making two copies of a suspect's drive, there are now multiple hard drives that must be accounted for on the chain of custody form. Every investigator's computer worksheet should have as much details about the system as possible, such as the suspect and or custodian, the case number, the date, the location, who the investigator is, the make, model, serial number, CPU, RAM, BIOS, boot sequence order, OS, the specific drives, system time and date, actual time and date, the ports that are on it. Everything should be photographed and added to the investigator's report. In a business, that's a little different. In a business, there should already be a policy placed for something like this. Uh, if not, then the, the company needs to set it up so that if something has to, if a computer has to get investigated, the company who owns the device should be able to seize it without the need of getting permission of the employee because they're just a worker of the company. So for a business machine, there should already be a policy in place that says at any point in time, the employer can seize the device. And speaking of, there should also be a worksheet that is specific for the media, whether that is a hard disk, a micro SD card, a USB stick that notes as much detailed information as possible, including the drive that the data will be copied into. You could even have a list for servers if those are getting um, if those are getting seized. A list of everything from the make and model down to the BIOS time. While there are plenty of tools, and I've listed a few in the lecture notes that'll help you with your report writing. Something that I want you to keep in mind is noting the current time and the source of current time. All examined systems must be noted and compared to the investigator's time. The easiest thing to do is to set your time to UTC and do everything from UTC. Correct, a digital forensics lab must be set up where a business cannot get into and destroy the evidence. So for example, I had a, a professor who worked at JPL and he was one of uh, four other investigators, including himself, forensic investigators. And they, only those four people could walk into that lab only they had the access keys. So uh, anything like cleanup, anything like custodial work was only on those four people. Nobody else had the keys. Nobody else could get in to the, into the building, into the area where they worked. And that is completely on purpose to prevent anybody in JPL to, uh, to cause any trouble like that, like destroying evidence. Your report, and this is why I, um, you haven't had any labs where you have to write reports yet, because this is now where we're finally going to talk about it. Your reports should be technically precise, 
yet the report also needs to be comprehensive so that someone with limited technical knowledge, like a jury or a judge, can understand the investigator's actions and report findings. If the report has acronyms or technical terms, they should all be explained. No ambiguity should exist in the report. Using graphical representation for data can help remove ambiguity, such as a graphical time of events, a graphic of network networked friends on a, on a Facebook network, maps including, including a geotag metadata information. Ultimately, your report should be detailed enough for someone to use your report to recreate the same analysis and retrieve the same results. A prudent investigation that produce facts for the case will have nothing to worry about. It is the duty of the investigator to be fair to both the prosecution and the defense. A example structure of your report is in the lecture notes. For example, you need to have a cover page that has the title of the report, the author, the department or investigate or organization, investigation number, report date, any signatures involved. Should have a table of contents to assist attorneys and any expert witnesses. Should have an executive summary, the synopsis of the purpose of the examination and the investigator's major findings. I should have a biography of the investigator highlighting all relevant experience such as college degrees, certification and digital forensics training classes completed, hours of pertinent training hours, uh, detailed investigative and professional experience. This section essentially should explain why the investigator was a suitable expert to conduct an investigation and produce reliable findings related to the case. An optional thing Thing to add is the purpose of the investigation. A report writer may have explained the reason for conducting the investigation in the executive summary. Investigators may use this to explain the reason for the investigation and the scope of the warrant. There should be a methodology explaining the science behind the investigation. The approach the examiner took with the rationale for the choice of hardware and software used. Investigators can reference standard practices used by the DOJ or NIST, for example. Should have a section for the electronic media analyzed. Detailed description of the media examined, how the storage of media related to other media examined, objects related to the suspect, all dates and times detailed and clearly outlined for every step taken in the examination. Report findings. It's important for the investigator to state the facts and be careful about interpretations, which is for the attorneys and the juries to decide. For example, it is improper in your report to write something like Joe Doe downloaded thousands of images of children being abused. That is improper. What you should do, which is proper, is write something like an analysis was performed on the hard disk drive removed from Dell computer model this, service tag this. The computer was seized from the residence of John Doe at this location, this address. A total of 500,788 whatever images of children were downloaded to this computer. John Doe noted in his statement to police dated July 27, 2020 that he was the only user of that computer at the residence. During the analysis, it was discovered from an analysis of Windows Registry that the only that the only user was set up on the on the computer. The examiner also discovered a login and password on this Dell computer. Detailed, clear, not uh, not trying to put any interpretation. You have to let the attorneys handle that. In your reports, you need to have investigation details connected to the case. These are notes supporting evidence to the investigation that is not digital, like statements from a suspect and witnesses. Any exhibits and appendices 
like the photos of seized objects, screenshots from the computer, tagged photos, printed emails, other files of interest. Appendices can include forms like evidence list and search warrant. And lastly, the glossary. Placing a comprehensive glossary is a good practice as it will diminish any arguments of inequality. Because again, defense counsels often argue they were at a disadvantage because of the lack of resources available to their investigation compared to those available to law enforcement. And if at any point they can prove that true, they can throw out evidence and help win their case. And that will, in essence, look bad on you. Speaking of you as the investigator, an expert witness can create an investigative report or review the findings of a report and interpret those findings based on specialized education, training, and knowledge. They are usually hired by the defense or the prosecuting attorney to be an advisor and can be called upon a trial to discredit or refute the report findings, draw out the importance of incriminating evidence highlighted in the report. In a trial, expert witnesses educate the jury. An expert witness called to testify will most certainly be cross-examined. The role of the expert witness at trial is described in the federal rules of evidence. And there's two. In general, not automatically objectionable. An opinion is not objectionable just because it embraces an ultimate issue. And then there's also an exception. In a criminal case, an expert witness must not state an opinion about whether the defendant did or did not have a mental state or condition that constitutes an element of the crime charged or of a defense. Those matters are for the trier of the fact alone. As expert witnesses, your goal is to educate the jury and break down complex concepts into meaningful information, such as using metaphors or other analogies to aid with comprehension. The expert is also there to persuade while weaving in important concepts that can help. The expert should aim to imprint core concepts into the mind of the jurors through repetition of those concepts. In most cases, the expert witness is required to provide a written report. Uh, those reports must contain things like a complete statement of all opinions the witness will express and the basis and reasons for them the facts or data considered by the witness informing them, any exhibits that will be used to summarize or support, the witness's qualifications, and a list of all other cases which during the past four years, the witness testified as an expert at trial or deposition, and a statement of compensation to be paid for the study and testimony in the case. The expert witness should ensure that they are up to date and have refreshed their memory about the document in question. If you will be acting as an expert witness, the client attorney will help you prepare for your expert testimony. An expert witness may, may bring a portfolio of exhibits and props to the court to help explain concepts clear with attorneys beforehand. It is perfectly acceptable to bring a binder of well-organized notes to the trial and refer when questions are asked. There's a few other notes from the author. An expert witness can be asked hypothetical questions. When answering these type of questions, the answer must be rooted in facts. An expert should resist going beyond answering the question and not volunteer additional information. The expert should resist being pulled out of his realm of expertise which could be employed by the defense to discredit their expertise and make them look uncomfortable and less confident. The expert should always be courteous to everyone in the court, but especially with the court reporter and the judge. Never talk over someone else speaking in the courtroom or the court reporter will reprimand you. Don't forget to Address the judge as your honor, not miss or ma'am. 
When answering questions, be clear about who did what and when. Always avoid qualifying words such as probably. Have the conviction to say, I don't know. That is outside my area of expertise. When summarizing key concepts, be sure to include important facts derived from the evidence. Be clear about units of measurements, for example, eight gigabytes of RAM. Pay attention to the time zones, which again, defense attorneys will ask questions about. Any questions? Looking at my chat. I'm looking at YouTube. Looking at Discord. Nothing. Okay. So let me stop this recording and I'll talk about the lab. <laughs>